Give Me 15 Minute Education Program for Medical Professionals. My name is Jennifer Searfoss, and I am the founder and CEO of the Searfoss Consulting Group. This presentation will address what you need to know about the 2014 Office of the Inspector General Work Plan. This session, along with many others, is available for free through iTunes as a podcast or as a video archive on YouTube. Learn more at scghealth.com. One quick legal note. None of the information contained in this presentation should be construed as legal advice. I encourage you to contact counsel if you have any questions regarding state or federal law that apply to the concepts covered in this session. With that, let's get started and cover what to expect this year, 2014, with the Office of the Inspector General's work plan. We're going to cover a number of topics. Notably, we're going to start with who is the OIG, what is their work plan about, and get into the history with it, and also we'll talk then about what to look forward to over the next several um, months and, and uh, where the OIG is going to go. So let's just start with who the heck is this OIG? The OIG is, uh, is a part of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. They are a um, entity within it, and really they are tasked with doing fraud and abuse. They've been around since 1990, or excuse me, 1976, and quote, they're there to protect the integrity of Health and Human Services uh, and really get into the different programs. And there's about 300 programs that they work with. But notably, they are the fraud and abuse uh, police. They are the ones that go and investigate opportunities for fraud or abuse they're seeing among the contractors they work with. And so they oftentimes are going to work with the Federal Bureau of Investigations when they're doing true investigations into medical practices. Um, when we talk about bringing in uh, investigative teams, oftentimes it's actually the FBI who is doing it. They'll be led by the OIG. Um, and as we all know, the FBI really isn't familiar with health care. So that's a whole other discussion about how to respond when the FBI comes knocking. But Again, we're going to just really talk about the OIG and where those investigations with different federal entities are going to focus. Normally, they put out the work plan in the fall, and that has to do with the uh, timeframes on budgeting. Um, notably, uh, the federal government is on a fiscal year that starts October 1, and so generally we get the work plan in October related to the budget. This year, it came out in January, and uh, it may be related to, again, this, the closing of the federal government in its time frame, uh, and also maybe some strategic aspects for delaying their, their work plan. But it did come out in January. And it's really a, pay, a playbook of everything that they're working on. So to give you an idea of the scope of where they do investigations, it's for all parts of Medicare. So part A, which is inpatient, part B, which is your outpatient physician type services, ASCs, uh, outpatient hospital departments, part C, which is your Medicare Advantage programs, and part D, which is the drug programs. Um, all state Medicaid programs, because they have a federal matching, those also fall under the auspices of the Office of the Inspector General. Um, any legal and in investigative reviews that the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services comes up with, public health reviews, also anything that Health and Human Services comes up with, and then anything else that the Secretary deems important for them to work on. So, the first work plan that's really available on the internet goes back to 1997. So there's actually a really good archive for us to look at the trends over the years. And one of the things really to think about when you look at the work plan is that the Office of the Inspector General is going to be reactionary to things that they've seen as problems and continuing problems, but they also are going to be responsive to new legislative priorities and notably other interesting trends going on. So for example, Anytime you have a big consulting group that does a whole bunch of advertising on new revenue opportunities, guess what? The Office of the Inspector General goes, hey, let's go look at those. So as you see trends within coding and other uh, revenue generating type of business, guess what? The Office of the Inspector General is going to go in and uh, highlight that as being an opportunity for investigation. This year is definitely uh, a little notable on that because there was one specialty for the first time that's actually been specialized and, and singled out. 
So for the 2014 focus, we're going to deep dive into the work plan and the information that came out in January. But notably, all the investigations are going to be based off of 2012 claims. So the first one, this has been an ongoing investigation over the last several years, nothing new with excessive evaluation and management payments. So this is going to be your face-to-face -face visits. This is going to be for new patients, established patients. If you recall, Medicare does not pay for consults, so consults obviously fall outside the auspices. Uh, but based on 2012 data and the claims coming back at that point, they're really beginning to see this huge increase in the amount and volume of face-to-face -face encounters. So really, one of the things, too, that they're looking at is when there's multiple E&M services that are being billed on the same day for the same patient. Um, so in instances where there is a multi-specialty practice and that patient is going to different parts in the, in the uh, practice, also let's say that rounding is happening and physicians, um, two different physicians from the same group are seeing the patient in rounding. Uh, guess what? Those are going to be the ones that they're looking at. You've done a very careful job of getting paid with your modifiers. But what's going to be the issue is the medical record will, on audit will need to show that different diagnoses, different chronic or, or just new conditions are being addressed by the different physicians. I also note that I have a feeling incident two billing is going to come up on this one. So really it comes down to the information. So what's the big thing that you need to be looking for? Well, the big issue, and this is coming up over and over and over again, is cloned medical documentation. Physicians that are taking shortcuts and cloning past encounters for their current encounter documentation, if it's a direct match, there's going to be a lot of questions about it. So please go in and look at not only the practices of your physicians and other clinicians in their documentation, but also look at your template. And make sure as all of your clinicians are documenting the actual encounter that happens, that they are updating it. It needs to be unique to that encounter, and please, there needs to be something that has changed. Because if it's an exact match, there's going to be a lot of questions about the, that documentation. So do know that cloning is becoming a, a big area for scrutiny. Likewise, an ongoing area for a lot of scrutiny is imaging services. And this is really going in and looking at not only the appropriateness of it, but, but really the values that are associated with imaging. So the OIG is specifically looking at the practice expenses. So any cuts that they recommend, and they're, of course, going to recommend cuts and not any boosts. Um, but this will be in addition to any RVU adjustment that is being done by CMS. Um, also, it would be in addition to any of the multiple procedure reductions that are already in place. So I would anticipate recommendations being adopted even, honestly, before there's any congressional involvement or um, endorsement of it, this is likely going to be in the next rulemaking that comes out from CMS, which we'll anticipate July of 2014. And then I would anticipate further downward spirals on the practice expense in, in out years. So along with that, lab tests. Not only has the OIG once again picked this up, but Congress has too. And it really is a big issue because spending rose 92% between 1998 and 2008 because of that and just the volume of the amount of money that's been spent over that decade. Guess what? CMS is really looking at this. And Congress then reemphasized the point of looking at this and the appropriateness for reimbursement uh, and the, the actual rates that are valued for today, not necessarily a decade ago, uh, but looking at those rates as part of uh, the doc fix bill. So more coming on that. Again, I would anticipate that a lot of changes to be seen in the upcoming rule that will be due out in July 2014. As I noted earlier, one specialty was singled out. That's ophthalmology. And ophthalmology is going to really have to look at what's going on. I know that the association has said that you know there's nothing that they're aware of. But because of, um, I'd say, again, that those darn consultants that are out making a great deal of, of noise about opportunities for revenue. This is uh, falling under higher scrutiny. So notably, they are targeting the 2012 claim cycle. Again, all of this is really focused on 2012. But using some new tools and technology that they have that came from the credit card industry, they're going to be looking for regional variances and specifically inappropriate billing. So this is going to be where it doesn't meet medical necessity. Um, and notably, too, where it doesn't meet local coverage decisions. So what are the max having? We'll talk a little bit more about that. But 
this one's going to be a really big deal uh, for ophthalmology, and again, it's going to go in and, and really delve into those claims. So excessive billing, um, this is where patients are being balanced billed over and above the Medicare allowable. And this is not only just for participating providers, but also non-participating providers that accept assignments. And then also for charges for non-covered services and whether or not an ABN was given. So my big note on this one is definitely look at an over-ABN people. Really, it's not a big deal. Use an ABN when it's never covered. Document it. Again, those reasonable charges need to be given, as, you know, documented and that notice shown that the patient knew about it prior to the time of service. Regarding balance billing, if your office is balance billing, you need to stop it and you need to think about what you're going to be uh, giving back to people. Um, balance billing is definitely uh, one of those tactics that is not allowed any time for any payer. You have to accept the allowable at the time of service. So questions on that, definitely work with my group and we'll be able to solve that for you. Place of service, this is one I think that's becoming a gaming issue with the hospitals purchasing the uh, office department. So it's going to be a really interesting thing, but really it comes down to when uh, site of service 11, which is for the office setting, is being billed in when, quite honestly, it should have been a facility, so either an outpatient hospital or an ambulatory surgical center. So they'll be going in and looking at whether or not practices are gaming that. The same way with physical therapy, uh, because of high utilization right now and the increase of physical therapy, uh, this is really continuing to gain some notoriety and review. And it may actually be part of the uh, effort to remove physical therapy as an exception for, and allowed in the in-office ancillary exception to the federal self-referral bill known as the Stark Law. Sleep testing, another area, two codes of note. It's 95810 and 95811 that are at issue in particular for sleep testing. And here there's some local coverage decisions at issue. Um, make sure you do have, anytime there's a local coverage decision, keep a copy of the local coverage decision at that time so you have it on file to, die, to really reinforce how you were able to uh, document and meet the coverage requirements. The reason you need it for that time is that these things do change, and oftentimes, again, your investigators may not have the historical coverage decisions. Part B drugs. Off-label use for physician-administered drugs. That's what they're looking at. So again, documentation for any physician-administered drug for the type of utilization and how it meets FDA, FDA guidelines is a really big deal. For off-label use, again, you're going to need to ensure that there is a coverage decision that specifically speaks to that off-label use. My probably favorite one out of this one is Physician Compare. The FCD Inspector General is responding to complaints from the provider community that the Medicare website has a lot of erroneous information. So I'm excited about this one. It's something that's good for the provider community. So I can't wait for them to show how bad it is. The next one has to do with Medicare Advantage and all of the heinous coding that's going on. So those annoying medical chart requests that you get for your Medicare Advantage plans and those patients and how that plan is telling you to increase the severity on your coding, that's so that they can get more money. And, uh, and so right now the legitimacy of those practices and how it's being documented, that's going to be a really big deal. So. Right now, it's unclear the downstream effect. It's going to have an effect on, on physicians and their practices, uh, but it's unclear yet how this is going to impact. So we'll just have to wait as the OIG does their work. The last one is enrollment screening. If you are in um, a process of trying to credential for Medicare, any of your practitioners, there may be a delay in higher scrutiny on this. The OIG is looking at it. Personally, we've got one doctor where they're requesting a lot of copies of documents that they haven't in the past, and that has to do with this, uh, this oversight coming from the OIG related to how they're doing initial credentialing and revalidation. All of this, of course, is called enrollment in the Medicare context. Overpayments. Some uh, scrutiny is going to happen with ZPICs and the program safeguard contractors. So these are the groups looking for fraud and abuse out in the medical community. They are localized contractors. And specifically, they're looking at, again, the provider community has said that a number of these investigations are overturned on appeal. They take money back, and then it's not proven that there's a problem. 
We've also shown that a number of times when it's overturned on appeal, it takes months to get the money back. So OIG is looking into this one. Again, this is a, actually a, a good turn for the physician community. So with that, there's a lot going on with the Office of the Inspector General and a lot of opportunity for physicians to, if nothing else, tighten up documentation and coding practices and ensure that documentation is compliant with the Medicare coding and docu documentation guidelines. So I want to thank you so much for this presentation and joining me. For those of you that are listening to the podcast or watching the video archive, please remember to rate this recording in iTunes or YouTube. To receive notices about upcoming Give Me 15 Minute programs or other educational sessions, please sign up on scghealth.com. Thank you for joining me for this 15-minute education program. This concludes the presentation.